Good. The future role of the D9 Plus, delivering an innovative economy fit for global leadership. That's the topic of this afternoon's discussion. Welcome to you all here in person and online, and a particular welcome to our speakers and Minister Kaliri. Uh, and also thanks to Amazon, one of our most active members for supporting this event today. Um, we've got uh, a little more than an hour. Uh, we're running slightly late. Uh, so rather than me going into any formal introductions, I think you've all read who, we're, uh, who we have today. I'm going to hand over to the Minister uh, to give the opening sort of 15-minute address. Thank you, Minister. Good morning, or good afternoon, rather, everybody. My apologies. Uh, I was just delayed there. Um, there's an incident unfolding, and our thoughts are with everybody uh, who's being affected by it. Um, but I am delighted to be here with you all uh, with... To talk about D9, it's uh, uh, welcome everybody that's here, everybody that's online. Um, I think D9 is something that's incredibly important for Ireland, an incredibly important forum, and will be even so next year when we share it. Uh, and I look forward to welcoming it uh, to Dublin. It merged in Sweden uh, back in 2016, and Ireland was a key player in its formation back then. Uh, at that time, the European Commission had a relatively new focus on digital and a large package of files, which was collectively known as the digital single market files, were under discussion. A group of like-minded uh, member states worked effectively together in Brussels on those specific legislative proposals. And following on uh, from that work and growing from that work, uh, the D9 was set up and had a higher level strategic, more long-term uh, mandate. Essentially, in 2023, the vision uh, of the D9 remains that what was established in Sweden back in 2016. It's a political and a public initiative. It's based in capitals. Representation is at a political level. And it's a platform for dialogue with the public and with the business sector, and a forum for visionary and for challenging debate on the future digitalization issues. Since then, numerous exchanges uh, are regularly held at ministerial level in the D9 capitals around issues such as the DSM, and now that the digital decade has taken its place and has grown from that original small focus on the digital single market and an acceptance that our economies are even more tied to technological advances, the D9 has become very firmly rooted. But the digital and the green transition have become interlinked and are front and center for all policymakers for our future economic, our social and environmental well-being. The very flexible format of the D9 has been an important factor in allowing member states to exchange constructively. To use a famous EU phrase that uh, my colleague, former Minister Creighton, will be well used to, there is a degree of constructive ambiguity around D9 moniker. At its core, we're small countries, uh, originating, if I'm not mistaken, in those countries that were digital frontrunners, according to the first European Commission DESI Index, published in 2015. However, the format of the meetings has been and continues to be flexible. And at times it's included Norway and the UK and others. And now D9 has become D9 plus and has grown to 12 members uh, as envisaged when the group was first emerged. The purpose of D9 has always been about the necessity of smaller member states to work together to maintain their collective influence on the EU stage. D9 countries don't, as a course, agree on everything. And indeed, views will change and views will evolve over time. And that is why that flexible format is important. And as digital policy cuts across many different ministries, uh, across many different countries in all member uh, countries, a minister depending, attending and participating in D9 events depends on the focus of the discussion. So, for instance, next month's D9 Plus ministerial meeting in Brussels will have two ministers, my colleague Oshin Smith, who leads on connectivity and e-government, to along with myself, focusing on the digital economy. The world was very different in 2016, even though it was only uh, eight years, seven years ago. But yet the changes that are happening as we speak and that have happened since have uh, underlined the continued importance of multilateral and global cooperation, and underline the importance of the D9. 2016 was the year that the UK voted to leave. Um, many of the D9 would have naturally gravitated towards UK's worldview at the time, 
which is very much on the open side of open strategic autonomy. In response to the UK's departure, there is a greater need for smaller EU members to invest in building up our capital to capital relationships. And in Ireland, we are and have always been very conscious of this. And as part of the global Ireland strategy, with a commitment to deepening our global footprint, we are strengthening and continuing to strengthen our diplomatic presence in EU countries. We are also conscious that, as I said previously, small countries on the EU stage must work together to allow our voice to be heard. And of course, the D9 isn't necessarily small countries. We count Sp Spain and Poland amongst our number. And if anyone is struggling on EU mathematics, that would just be about enough to make a blocking uh, minority. But that is not our purpose. It, the D9 is there for cooperation, for collaboration, but equally, it also shows that the D9 cannot be ignored. 2016, the world was slightly more tech optimistic. Um, I think geopolitically, even then, there were cracks. Um, some of those are now deepened significantly. And digital policy has become responsive to the events and to the technologies that have emerged during that time. In 2016, the only significant digital legislation on the horizon was GDPR, which came into force as subsequently. Collectively, we in the EU, EU have developed significant digital regulation since then, in areas such as audiovisual policy, access to data, consumer and competition policy, and online safety. Two recent key pieces of legislation that will impact on all Europeans are the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. The Artificial Intelligence Act, the AI Act, is another key digital file, and that is coming to finalization as we speak. Europe has been a pioneer on the digital regulatory front, and Europe has been instrumental in, settling, in set, setting and settling uh, global standards, all based on shared values and on principles. And already we can see this taking shape in AI with a global push to address the potential risks. The digital world has no borders, and it's important that Europe continues to set an example in terms of cooperation and collaboration that others see a value in following. Here in Ireland, we have, we continue, and we will continue to play an outsized role in enforcing and in drafting this legislation. We are committed to providing the necessary legislation and the relevant resources for their timely and effective implementation. Commission Amman was formally established last March. It is Ireland's digital services coordinator under the Digital Services Act, and it will also enforce the audiovisual media services directive and the terrorist content, content online regulations. Legislation is in preparation to give existing bodies additional powers arising from the Digital Markets Act, from the Data Act and the Data Governance Act. The Consumer and Competition Protection Commission, COMREG, the Office of Government Chief Information Officer, and the S Central Statistics Office will all gain extra powers under this. And within my own department, we are investing significantly in CCPC and in Commission Amman to allow them to have the resources to fulfill their mandate. And we continue as a government to expand the role of the Data Protection Commission. It's a challenge to constantly keep ahead uh, of legislation and of technology in this space and to ensure the appropriate resources are being invested. We have excellent cross-governmental collaboration, which is essential due to the interlinkages between all of these areas and to ensure clear and effective structures in light of the importance of Ireland as the European place of establishment for 11 of 13 very large online platforms as designated. As these regulations take effect and begin to deepen, we will contain a, continue to maintain an ongoing review of resources to ensure that our regulators possess the necessary skills, staffing levels, and technological backup for effective implementation. Domestically, we are continuing to make strides in implementing Harnessing Digital, which is our national digital strategy. Our strategy aligns with the digital decade vision of the EU with its four pillars, digital infrastructure, digital government, digital skills, and the digitalization of business. A progress report will be presented to Cabinet shortly. My department also leads on the national AI strategy, AI Here for Good, and we have made substantial progress in the two years since its launch. 
This year's DESI index continues to show Ireland's strong performance relative to our EU peer peers, but we must continue to strive to improve in order to meet our very ambitious targets in relation to digitalization of business, which includes an update of big data, cloud and AI to 80% of businesses, which Enterprise Ireland, our local enterprise office network, and our four European digital innovation hubs are continuing to drive. We are finalizing the Grow Digital portal, which will allow companies to access their digital presence, their digital maturity, and to find solutions to suit the specific company to meet the targets that we are setting. And we are examining how to broaden eligibility for digital funding schemes. The close engagement between D9 and the business community, which I mentioned as the founding principle of D9, has been solidified through the B9 with IBEC instrumental in this group. B9 now meets alongside D9 to facilitate this dialogue and ongoing communication. As I said at the outset, Ireland will take the chair of the D9 for the first half of 2024. The D9 ministerial gathering will be held in April and it will coincide with our annual Digital Ireland Conference, which we will be hosting in Dublin Castle on the 18th of April. This conference, the first uh, alliteration of which we ran this time last year, will be a very exciting opportunity to engage business community, political community, the academic and key players in our local innovation ecosystem, and to get them together in discussions in the one venue. The two themes for the Digital Ireland Conference will be AI and looking to the digital priorities of the next European Commission. The D9 Plus Ministerial will discuss the importance of a consistent, of a coherent, but also of an innovative approach to EU digital regulation. We want regulation, we want to ensure that it works, but that it works with and not against innovation and economic opportunity. We will have, I'm sure, a no doubt, also use the opportunity of that time, maybe two months out from European elections to discuss priorities for the next European Parliament and the next European Commission in this space. And I'm absolutely determined that Ireland will use the full six months that we hold the D9 Plus Chair to share the Irish vision that a proportionate approach to digital regulation will lay a strong foundation for an innovative, a thriving and a lively digital single market in Europe, which respects those four key principles of D9 that I outlined at the beginning. I look forward to you all joining us in Dublin Castle in April. I look forward to engagement on D9 and D9 Plus issues with the IIEA between now and then. Um, and I look forward to hearing about today's discussions. Bermuda Magraf. Uh, many thanks, Minister, for that. Exactly to, uh, to time as well. Uh, before joining our panelists to respond and give their own perspectives from Belgium on screen, from Spain uh, to my left here on the panel and from Ireland, uh, let me just do a couple of the, the standard housekeeping um, notes. Uh, your questions are very welcome. Anybody here just indicate to me at any point during the course of the discussion that you you like to pose a question. Anybody online who wants to put a question, uh, I'm looking at a screen in front of me, they will come up and I'll be able to put those questions to the speaker. You might identify yourself, whether you're here in person or online, uh, so that we know who you are. And also just to remind everyone, everything today is on the record. And that includes obviously anybody posing questions, uh, as you might imagine. So with that, let me go to our first speaker, uh, uh, first panelist, I should say, Alberto Gago Fernandez, who's advisor to the Secretary of State for Digitalization and AI of Spain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have a speech as such. I will just, uh, you know, give a bit, a few comments on, on what the minister just referred to. Spain is indeed one of the D9 plus countries since 2021. We, we enter into this into this group quite late, but because we had a commitment and the first uh, the, the firm belief that the, the the group can solidify impact in whatever is going to happen in the in the future of the commission and also in defining all the political uh, priorities that the commission was going to have. And this happened. This was very clear when we signed um, the declaration on the digital decade back in 2021. Uh, together with the D9 uh, plus countries, and that had a, a, a real impact in how the Commission defined uh, the digital decade uh, policy program that was then uh, put into a decision, and it was then adopted by by all the member states in the 
uh, in the council and, and also together with the parliament, the co-legislator. Um, uh, since then, uh, Spain saw the potential of this and we wanted also to host uh, or to chair uh, the, the D9 plus uh, group. And we did that in December 2022. So the second part of 22, uh, together with the digital economy ministerial meeting that we organized in the Canary Islands uh, of the OECD minister. So that means that uh, we brought uh, to the Canary Islands to talk about digital economy, more than uh, 40 countries of the world, the 38 that are part of the uh, of the OECD plus other MBTs, for example, Indonesia, which, was, which at that time was the presidency of the G20 uh, and other other countries uh, where discussions focus a lot on how to ensure digital rights are part of, of the digital transformation. And the human centric uh, vision that we are having at the European Union is not only a focus on the fact that humans should be at the center, but their rights should be at the center. So they should be empowered to use those rights uh, when they are online uh, in a platform or when they are uh, faced with a decision taken by a, an AI algorithm or in any other, or with their data when it's uh, when it's shared, either for uh, commercial or non-commercial purposes. Uh, we brought the discussion in the OECD. Also, we, we tackled these issues as well uh, within our D9 uh, Plus uh, meeting, where we uh, put forward a statement, a chair statement that was agreed by all the members. Uh, on, on, the, on one side was on 5G, uh, cyber security, and on the other side was on, um, on digital skills and how we should um, look at, uh, at building uh, the necessary skills uh, in the European Union in order to be able to, um, to, to cope with the digital transformation. Not only basic skills uh, of individuals uh, at all ages, of, of, of your life, but also advanced skills so that we have enough workforce to uh, cope with the transition that our economies are going to, um, uh, to, to, you know, to, to enter. Um, in this regard, this was uh, also key because uh, on 2023, I don't know if you know, but it was the year of skills for many for the European uh, for the European Union. So that was interesting to see how uh, all the digital nine plus uh, states were proposing initiatives that they have done nationally. For example, the Ireland proposed a skill net uh, initiative. Uh, and that could be an example that can be scaled at European level through through more harmonization from more coordination uh, and, and also to have enough uh, information for the policymakers at the, at the European Commission to to um to build a future policies on 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 advancing digital skills and and now um after after the d9 so we are holding at the moment the presidency of the council of the eu you all know this already we have um we have one of those uh it's called in English golden presidencies because you suppose that you finish, you have to finish all the legislative action that it's already uh, negotiated in Spain. We call it the brush presidency so that you brush things out away. Uh, it's a bit funny how uh, the translation is, is there. Um, so, so we do have, uh, we focus on, on that matter on, I mean, we close the EIDAS, the Digital Identity, uh, uh, European Digital Identity Regulation. We close the European Interoperability Act uh, in order for uh, public administrations to be interoperable um, with all of them. And we are now in the, let's say, in the verge of closing the Cyber Resilience Act that, you know, it's about software and hardware uh, and IoT products, uh, the cybersecurity of those of those products and software. Uh, and also we are now in the final stages of the negotiation on the AI Act that, I mean, if there are questions, I can, uh, we can also talk about this too, because I'm, I'm involved myself in the trilogues or, or and the technical meetings or, or on that on that aspect. Um, and but I mean that, that that is important for sure. But what we th what we saw from the very beginning is is what you minister referred to that the possibility to, to influence the next commission mandate. And in this regard we have adopted four uh, declarations. Uh, two of them with uh, with Ireland, uh, one on uh, the development of human-centric and rights-oriented neurotechnologies, 
uh, for the future of the union because it's important that we look at these technologies that are uh, going to help us um, overcome some of the challenges in degenerative diseases, for example, but also are going to open up a lot of competitive uh, competitiveness in the area of uh, education and also entertainment. So we need to develop these technologies. Uh, uh, Spain, the European Union have a lot of potential on, on being at the forefront of these technologies, but we need to do this uh, always considering our vision of human centricity and, and rights oriented. Um, as well, we have adopted another declaration on Europe startups and scale-ups uh, on the need that we need to have uh, on the need that the commission needs to put forward a, a strategy on this aspect in particular that goes throughout the whole life cycle of startups and scale-ups not only on how to create new startups but also on on how they exit to this uh, to the market or uh, their exit strategies um, to the stock market uh, sorry or also the, the the challenges that they may have with regards to attraction of talent or attraction of, of finance or investment here in the European Union. Apart from that, we also adopted a, a, a presidency declaration on, on a trusted uh, data with trusted uh, cloud to produce trusted AI uh, in the context of Gaia X, which Ireland, I believe, is also part of this of this family. Um, and finally, uh, last week we we held the AI Alliance in Madrid, uh, 16 and 17, and we adopted uh, uh, another declaration with uh, 15 uh, countries, 15 states from Latin America and the European Union to reinforce and cooperate and converge on AI policy and uh, regulatory framework so that whatever we do at the European Union, it also becomes, as you mentioned, Minister, a global standard in the world. As it happened with the GDPR, we, uh, from the Spanish presidency, we see that it's clear that all the legislation that we are putting forward together, it's going to come to become a golden standard because it's the top standard that, that you know companies may will have in the world, and it's easier to adopt that standard and apply, apply it across across the board rather than you know modulating your policies, your internal uh, commercial policies to each each uh, each and every country. Um, and with this, I mean uh, this is. What I, I wanted to bring to the table, how important it is that countries that are that have a vision, they get together and they and they put it forward in writing, uh, in papers, in declarations, either if it's uh, as D9 plus or if it's, or if or if it is in the in the context of the Council Presidency that Belgium will get uh, in the next six months. Uh, but it's important that it's out there because then Commission and the European Union can be influenced and can be inspired by this and have already a basis on, on which to work. Great. Thank you, Alberto. Let me just say that the Minister, I understand, has to leave quite shortly. A few moments. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, so before moving on uh, to our second panelist, Lucinda Creighton, who's the CEO of Vulcan Consulting and a former Minister of State for Europe, as most of you will know. Thank you very much um, and uh, uh, delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, for the opportunity to exchange some thoughts on um, on what is a really important topic. Um, one that has, I suppose, been a theme for the Irish government for a very long time now um, in terms of advancing the uh, digital innovation agenda, the digital single market. Um, I mean, probably for 15 to 20 years now, that has been a core theme of pretty much every every government. Um, and I suppose the question that, that we have to pose and that we have to reflect on is, well, how do we actually make that a reality? And how do we maybe move beyond um, the, uh, the ambition uh, or the um, the sort of objective and actually um, uh, become a little bit more effective at uh, implementation and 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 action um, and that's no mean feat um, uh, that's for sure um, when it comes to the d9 um, uh, when it was founded in 2016 I think that there was a real sense of momentum there was a sense of urgency and I think that Ireland and a number of the other founding member states, particularly Sweden, uh, were were really committed and really motivated and mobilized. And um, I I would I would certainly have the feeling that um, uh, since then the the that that sense of kind of urgency and commitment has maybe dissipated a little bit. So I think. Um, uh, for that reason, um, our timing in terms of having a minister, firstly, who is um, really committed to this and uh, energized um, and also approaching 
Ireland's presidency um, or chairmanship of the D9 Plus group next year really presents an excellent opportunity. Um, I mean, if you look at the objectives, the original objectives um, of the D9 group, um, I think they are legitimate. I think they are worthy. I think we probably everybody in the room and most people would uh, subscribe to them. Um, but, you know, I think that there is scope for greater definition in terms of the purpose and the objectives of the group. Um, and I, I also feel that um, when you look at the world that we live in, and uh, Minister Cleary has already alluded to the fact that things have changed a lot, even in those seven years, um, you know, the context of the geopolitical challenges that we have faced and that we now face are extraordinary. If you think about it, we've just lived through a pandemic, um, which um, catapulted lots of people into the digital world that weren't part of it or were you know, detached from it uh, up until a few years ago. So it has really accelerated and catalyzed um, the evolution of, um, of um, our digi digital uh, agenda, if you like. Um, and that's that's just one thing. Um, if you look at what has been happening in Ukraine, for example, um, and how uh, everything from aid to warfare to communication has changed, um, how hugely influential uh, tech companies have been in um, in the, the the fight for democracy in Ukraine, it is extraordinary, and we probably don't step back to think about it uh, sufficiently. Um, if you look at the implications of the war in Ukraine and the pandemic, actually not not uh, not unconnected, and how that has shaped the West's view of China and Russia, for example, the geopolitics around all of that, I think it's really interesting. It has changed the sense of urgency. It has changed the prioritization of the European Union. So. For example, and there, you know, there are questions that I think the D9 group, D9 plus group needs to address when I talk about greater clarity and definition of objectives. Um, one of the things that has been a huge theme for the European Union for the last four years um, and for this commission um, has been digital so sovereignty um, or strategic autonomy. They're interlinked or open strategic autonomy. Um, whatever way you look at it, um, I think it would be really beneficial for the D9 plus countries to have a clarity of purpose and a clarity of vision in terms of what those concepts actually mean. Um, they have changed, I think, probably even in the last four years when people talked about um, strategic autonomy a few years ago, they were probably thinking in terms more of military strategic autonomy some would say that certain member states were thinking about it in terms of de-risking from the United States or maybe introducing a form of protectionism when it comes to US multinational companies, particularly tech companies. Um, that has evolved. Um, I think if you see some of the uh, approach of the European Commission, you know, the, the concept of uh, strategic autonomy has become much broader um, and, um, and more pervasive. Uh, but also creates opportunities if you look at it from the perspective of open strategic autonomy, as opposed to closed or um, or um, a, a sort of a, um, a, a, a tool to um, to maybe reduce interaction or dependency with the rest of the world. So these are concepts that are changing, they're evolving. And I think it's really important that countries like Ireland have a very clear view of what they mean, firstly, what are the risks associated with those those um, terms and those concepts at EU policymaking level? But also, you know, what do we want them to mean? And uh, if they if we if they're here with us and we have to live with them, how do we shape them? How do we actually um, uh, take take really concrete steps? And I think the D nine plus group is um, is a really obvious way to. Um, to bring clarity to some of those um, concepts and to bring clarity in terms of what it is we want to achieve from the digital single market, um, from, um, from concepts such as digital sovereignty and so on. Um, uh, I think when you, when you speak to or you listen to the minister, to the Spanish 
uh, government um, and to the other members of um, the D9 plus group of member states, um, they, they certainly speak uh, clearly and supportively of the need for the digital agenda to deliver on innovation, on preserving and enhancing competitiveness at European level. But again, you know, are the policies and the regulations that we are introducing actually achieving those objectives? I think they, they are really important questions that we have to continuously ask ourselves, that we're not just a part of a, a sort of a sausage making uh, um, um, process of developing more and more regulation and, you know, praising or uh, clapping ourselves in the back for, you know, being the best in class when it comes to developing regulation on the on the global stage. What does that actually mean? Um, you know, we, we, the the EU is often accused, and I was a member of the EU Scrutiny Committee and the European Affairs Committee in the Irish Parliament for nine years. And um, the biggest criticism at every practically every meeting that we ever held was about gold plating EU regulation. Um, um, so that's that's a that's an Irish identity crisis that we that we have to deal with. But um, but in terms of um, of um, you know the 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 rush to to develop um, and to regulate de develop uh, regulation and to um, to implement regulation, um, are we really fully evaluating the impact of that regulation? Are we thinking of not just the implications for maybe the five top big tech companies that we might have at the forefront of our minds when we're developing it, but are we thinking of the ripple effect for our own indigenous businesses, for SMEs and for the ecosystem in Europe? I, I've come from uh, a lunch, um, uh, an American chamber uh, Thanksgiving lunch um, on the other side of town, which the minister was also attending. Um, and I was um, speaking to somebody um, uh, with a Finnish background and we were talking about um, about Nokia and about the huge presence that company had. And, you know, um, it, it was a European digital champion. Um, and there are many other examples of companies that maybe, you know, um, didn't have the opportunity to thrive and grow for whatever reason. And I think if we if we really want that digital ecosystem to um, to survive and thrive, uh, every single piece of legislation, every single policy decision has to be uh, taken with that lens of looking at what is the impact um, and how is it going to how is it going to uh, affect um, competitiveness and the potential for innovation and growth in the European economy. Um, I'm conscious uh, that we have to wrap up, but uh, just a final point on the on the D9 plus group because I think it is great that it pr provides a, a platform for dialogue and capital to capital engagement and publication of. Uh, non-papers or declarations, that's that's really good. Uh, but I would love to see um, a concrete mechanism for it to actually come to life in a more tangible way. Uh, I, I, I think that the Digital Nine Plus group would really benefit from a secretariat, from a presence in Brussels, um, because uh, having a dialogue between the capitals is really important, but legislation and regulation comes from the European Commission. It is obviously decided through co-decision by the Council and the Parliament, uh, both of which institutions also sit in Brussels. So I think it's really important that, um, and I think it's a real opportunity actually for Ireland to start thinking about this in the lead up to Ireland's presidency of the D9 next year, as we move into a new commission and a new parliament, how can the D9 plus formalize and how can it actually start thinking strategically about having a much greater impact and a much greater influence on EU policymaking and, um, and regulation so that we are fit for purpose in five and 10 and 15, 20 years time. Otherwise, I think the big risk is that other regions uh, around the globe will pass us out, irrespective of how much we believe that we have the golden standard in regulation. So a secretariat for the D9 in Brussels, teed up perfectly for our <laughs> final panelist, who uh, we'd like certainly like to get both both of our other panelists and indeed the minister's view, if he uh, has time, uh, on that proposal and many other things. So thanks, uh, Lucinda, for, for that thought-provoking contribution. Um, it, our final panelist is Alexander Hoffman. Hoffmans. He's the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Secretary of State for Digitalization 
uh, the Belgian in the Belgian government. You're very welcome, Alexander. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Perfectly. Can you hear me fine. Okay, great. Uh, thanks of all, first of all for uh, for inviting me. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you uh, this afternoon, but you have Alberto. He's he's a superman. I don't know how he how he does it during the Spanish presidency. He's everywhere. Um, first of all, yes, I, I like the sound of uh, another secretariat based in in Brussels. Uh, <laughs> I will get back to that. Um, I I thought of um, maybe focusing really on the D nine plus as such. Um, in my intervention, and I wanted to start with um, a few observations. I've been participating in the D9 Plus since I'm in office here, so that's 2020, so I've been through a, a couple of them um, with mixed feelings, uh, honestly. Um, it's a very interesting forum. Uh, institutionally, and this has been mentioned before, it's a very informal setting. Um, there is no structure, there is no secretariat, there is no rule book, there are no rules of procedure. So it's very flexible indeed. Uh, this can be an advantage, can also be a disadvantage, of course, because it's very much, let's say, chair driven. Um, and I think we've seen, at least from my experience, that um, there is no uh, real intensive dynam dynamism uh, in, in the D9 plus uh, as such up until now. It's been limited, let's say, to uh, a meeting uh, that is being organized during uh, the presidency or the chairmanship uh, of the D9 plus. Uh, but throughout, let's say, the chairmanship, there is little dialogue. Um, there is little dialogue. Um, in terms of composition, um, we are now indeed the D9 plus uh, counting uh, 12, but um, I have to say that de facto, I would say that we're already 14 uh, because um, Romania and Slovenia have been invited to participate in the past um, D9 plus sessions as well. Belgium has invited them uh, as well to participate. And of course, other member states of the EU uh, regularly come knocking on our door uh, to to um, to discuss membership, and there was a very courageous attempt uh, by the the Spanish chairmanship of the D9 Plus to try and structure a dialogue uh, around this uh, issue of how do we deal with this. Uh, there there are no criteria. Um, basically, a member state sends an email to the the mailing list, uh, and then we discuss it electronically uh, among the member states. Um, but there is not really any standard, let's say, or a criteria. Of course, originally it's the DAISY uh, criteria, um, but I have the feeling that we've uh, maybe lost a little bit track uh, of that perspective. In terms of composition, what is interesting in the D9 plus, of course, is that there is a mix with what we call the B9 plus. So it's the business federations of uh, the member states. Uh, and this is a very interesting setting, of course. Uh, we always try to do a mixed composition uh, during uh, the, the meeting uh, of the chair, and, and I will come back to that as well. Third observation is um, in terms of the, the content. Uh, basically, um, the, the chair of the D9 Plus has uh, a certain wish list, let's say thematically, uh, that they want to um, bring to the table and discuss. Um, there is not necessarily a link with, uh, for example, the Telecom Council. Uh, for some issues there may be, for others there isn't. Uh, again, very flexible, positive, uh, maybe also some uh, disadvantages. So on the basis of their, these observations, um, where can we go in the future with the D9 plus? I think that's a very uh, valid and pertinent uh, point of discussion. Can the D9 plus be a real driver of the digital uh, agenda? And I think there we are entering into a very interesting uh, momentum. Uh, the minister referred to it uh, as well during the uh, uh, the Irish uh, chairmanship, uh, Belgium as well. Um, we will have a, a focus on uh, future looking, what will be the future digital agenda of the EU for the next uh, five years. Um, we will also discuss this during our Belgian presidency of the Council of the EU. Um, and I'm happy to come back to any questions on the Belgian presidency of the EU um, afterwards. Um, but say, so if we really want to have the D9 plus as a driver of the digital agenda, I think we have to answer some questions on or related to the, the observations that I made in terms of, uh, do we want to evolve towards a more organized and structured vehicle, hence uh, a secretariat, hence resources, um, question mark. Um, there has been some discussion, um, and this was mentioned a little bit, let's say, before already by the previous speakers, 
some discussion among some D9 members in terms of um, a blocking minority, indeed. I mean, if you do the counting, um, this is possible. And so it has already been discussed. Should the D9 plus be a little bit more, uh, let's say, organized in terms of how do we position ourselves uh, in the council, uh, telecom council or, or other council formations uh, as such? Question mark. Um, we would have to answer some questions about the membership uh, as well. Um, again, um, do we, looking back at what the minister said as well, on terms of the DNA of the D9+, plus, it's become a little bit mixed uh, already. Um, do we want to go back to, let's say, uh, strict respect of, of the D9 uh, plus DNA? Um, or uh, do we want to evolve towards a more mixed group and, let's say, uh, follow the line of indeed the member states who have a certain vision in terms of digital files, let's say open economy, uh, etc. Question mark. Um, do we want to um, have the D9 plus evolve towards having a firmer link with uh, the telecom council, for example? Mathematically, of course, that's not possible because uh, we cannot um, have every D9 member um, organize a chair linked to a D9, uh, sorry, linked to a, a telecom council. However, where it is possible, is this something that we want? And then in line with this as well, do we want the D9 plus to also be linked to the, the presidency of the council uh, of the EU? In terms of what our Belgian approach uh, to the D9 plus is and to, to our chairmanship, um, we, we have made the strategic choice to make the link to uh, the Telecom Council. We've made the strategic choice, first of all, to have the chairmanship now, just before our Belgian presidency of the EU. Um, and we've also made the strategic uh, decision to hold um, the meeting in Brussels on the 4th of December, the day before uh, the formal uh, Telecom Council in, in consultation with uh, the Spanish presidency. Why? It's uh, also simply because we have seen that in the past there has been a very mixed mixed participation uh, in terms of the, it is a political body, uh, but in terms of ministerial participation, it's been very mixed. So linking um, the D9 plus meeting to the formal telecom council, um, I think is a way to um, uh, improve, let's say, ministerial participation. And I'm very happy that Ireland will even be participating uh, in double, uh, let's say. So so that's one, uh, let's say, approach uh, of Belgium uh, to our, our chairmanship. Um, making the bridge to the Telecom Council also um, in our evening program. Uh, we will have a, a small fireside uh, chat event. We will have a walking dinner and all ministers participating in the formal Telecom Council have been uh, invited. Um, this is a way, again, to bridge uh, the D9 Plus and uh, the Telecom Council. Um, our approach um, is also to try and have a more dynamic um, participation between the B9 plus and the D9 plus. Um, traditionally, the, the B9 plus uh, participates in a mixed discussion with the D9 plus, limited to, let's say, a presentation of, of a B9 plus uh, statement and then with a Q&A. We will be uh, holding um, breakout sessions uh, where we want to, in small format, uh, have the D9 plus members discuss with the B9 plus members on the basis of a guiding document. Um, and this will be based on uh, the four pillars of the digital decade, the Digital Compass uh, 2030. Again, linked to what we are preparing already for our Belgian presidency of the EU in terms of future of the digital uh, agenda. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, but maybe not least, is that uh, Belgium is preparing council conclusions on the future of the digital agenda to be adopted um, on the formal council uh, on the 24th, uh, sorry, 21st of May. Um, it, it seems logical to us that we consult uh, the D9 plus in the drafting, of course, of the council conclusions, besides the usual dynamic that takes place um, in the telecom council, uh, of course. So I want to wrap it up here. Uh, this is our take on, on the D9+, plus, where it stands now and where it could head um, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Very um, straightforward uh, views there, which I'm sure will contribute to the, uh, the questions and the discussion we'll have. So as, as I mentioned, open to questions.
uh, I've just got to have to head, unfortunately, to another commitment. Just but, very briefly, that idea of a secretariat. Uh, well, let's see. We, we won't say about secretariat, but what I will do is I'll share this recording with our D9 Plus colleagues to provoke discussion. Um, Alexander set out a very ambitious schedule, but it's one thing that strikes me, we're very aligned with the Telecoms Council, but the Competitiveness Council also meets that week. So I'm actually, I'm going to be at Compesh later in the week, mm -hmm. and digital is crucial to competitiveness as well. So I, I, I think we need to probably align it to more councils, but um, I think Lucinda set us uh, really good targets and discussion uh, for our presidency and for our chair. Uh, and I look forward to following on for the extraordinary work that's been done by Belgium into uh, next year. And um, we may have one of these discussions again as part of it. Right. Thank so, you. Thank you, Evan. Thanks, Evan. Thank you, Master. And just to, I want to acknowledge the huge work that's been done by the Spaniards to try and get the AI legislation over the line. Um, you know, it's been an extraordinary uh, commitment and it won't be for the want of effort if it doesn't make it. So, thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, maybe just kick off on that uh, AI legislation. Um, do you, what did the panel think? Did, will, it, uh, will it get through before uh, the cutoff point next year? Uh, okay, so on the, on, but I would like to react on, I mean, sure. I think the points that uh, Alexander made were uh, fantastic to have a discussion amongst ourselves mm -hmm. because it very much ties to what, uh, what, what, you, what you also mentioned. Um, we did indeed uh, try to get the, the group to get that formal kind of a status because when we had the chairmanship, we had uh, seven requests from different member states that wanted to join the D9 Plus and we didn't know how to deal with mm -hmm. these requests. So can can we just get something uh, together to you know to formalize how we are going to deal with all this? And I I think this is very important and the strategic vision. Um, I, I I have to congratulate the the Belgians because uh, the fact that they tied with a political event uh, as the Telecom Council that takes political decisions is is really a, a good strategic decision that we need to consider if we want to um, to do uh, uh, to to to. To have an impact on on whatever we are uh, doing at European level, um, and uh, and I would like to also now I tie yeah, it with the with the AI Act, but to react to your uh, comment on going from ambition to implementation, I mean you're totally uh, right that we need to do this step. It's like when you do research and then it goes to the market. Well, you also have this uh, step to 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 make sure that you have a business model. So in in that regard, for us, uh, we did. Uh, we are really committed to the AI regulation, but we are also committed to the implementation of the AI regulation. And in this regard, we uh, already published uh, the, the law that establishes the sandbox on AI that Spain is going to put forward in order to uh, develop implementation guidelines of all the obligations that are applicable to high-risk AI systems. Um, uh, with the experience of particular uh, companies that develop AI, and uh, and then these guidelines that will be put uh, that will be finalized by the end of the following year, possibly, uh, will be put at the service of everybody to be able to implement the regulation in a in a clear way. Not only having you know an art, uh, an obligation that says you need to have your human oversight or you, or your system needs to be uh, needs to be cyber secure or robust, but what does it mean that in practice? And then we develop like 100 pages per, per obligation that says, well, tip one, you need to do this. Tip two, you need to ensure that you know, your database is structured. You don't have uh, this type of blank and you have your data representativeness in terms of sources and so on and so forth. Um, but I, I believe this is something that, you know, all member states should get uh, one of those type of, of initiatives and put, you know, you want to have a strategic autonomy. What is the practical project that you that you are putting forward in order to uh, to deploy this uh, this thinking, and, and I think it's a relevant it's a relevant choice, a relevant point that you made. Yeah. Lucinda, anything you want to come back on with any of the other uh, points that have been made, but specifically, um, Alexander sort of hinted at possibly getting back to the core of the D nine which might involve uninviting existing members, but I, mm. I, given the way institutions work, uninviting people can be quite difficult. You probably <laughs> need to establish something new um, rather than uh, shrinking something. So Alexander, I'll come back to you on that, on how, how you envisage that, but uh, Lucinda, you first, and any other reactions you have to anything else you've it could, it could become a process of natural attrition, you know? I mean, <laughs> uh, if you... Um, if you start to um, if you start to sort of agree on common principles, 
of membership, then, you know, it may become a natural process in a sense. Um, or you may have perhaps members that are, are, are not, um, you know, not fully committed. Um, I think, I mean, I think it comes back to when you start to really define what it is you're for, you know, what it is you want to achieve, what are the, what are the objectives and um, what are the policy priorities, you know, what do you want to see the next European commission actually doing? Um, and, you know, if if a cohort of of member states uh, start to think in that way and actually start to formalize it, um, you know, not everybody's going to agree. You know, that's that's just the way it works. Um, um, but there has to be a core group who have that level of commitment. And I, I think it's not apparent yet um, that 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 exists. We'll be the first to Brexit the D9. <laughs> <laughs> <I'd>, Texas. <laughs> I won't put you on the spot. We're on the record. Um, Alexander, just following on from that, that um, you were maybe a little bit downbeat about the efficacy in recent times. Um, how, how do you envisage, you know, if it was to shrink, do you agree with Lucinda that it would be a process of natural attrition? Do you think that some of the more committed members have to create something separate? I think, well, first of all, it's everybody will realize that it's politically very difficult for ministers to say no <laughs> to member states requesting uh, entry. So this is already always a very delicate um, balancing act, uh, let's say. Um, the way to um, deal with this uh, is is basically the right approach has been taken by by Spain in the terms of trying to um, formalize um, uh, to some extent, but not over formalizing of well of, as well. We want, of course, the D9 plus to remain a flexible group. Um, and then you come into systems of, okay, you have founding members and then you have observer status, et cetera. I think if you push it too far, then it becomes a bit too complicated uh, as well. We want it to remain a, a flexible group. But I think only by um, standardizing some issues, by having a common agreement but in a somewhat more formal way, can you create, um, to put it like that, a sort of like a, a barrier around the group um, without excluding, of course, the possibility of interaction with a wider group? And I think that's what we tried to do with making the bridge to all of the 27 uh, telecom ministers in, in our case, to have them involved as well in the D9 dynamic allow for B9 plus members to interact uh, also with the 27 um, uh, ministers of the Telecom Council. Um, but I think going so far as to really create uh, an institutional uh, context or a format, that's probably taking it a little bit too far. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I'll in terms of, you, you mentioned the sort of, um, EU's regulatory power globally. Um, you know, I was thinking when you were speaking uh, about how much things have changed in the ministry since 2016, you know, 2016, it was the, the, the expression, Americans innovate, Europeans regulate and Chinese emulate mm. um, or, in, or emulate, or I think was, was the term. Uh, that's clearly changed in terms of China these days. I, I, I do wonder if Europe in the services sector is not as influential as it has been in the goods sector, internationally traded goods. Is there any any sort of the US never adopted a GDPR, for example? Um, okay. you know, is 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 Europe's capacity to regulate AI with the mm -hmm. Chinese going as fast as they are, with so much happening in the United States, obviously. Mm -hmm. is, is Europe mm -hmm. either of you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a fundamental question because I think that we can be we can be guilty in Europe of believing our own propaganda and really believing that we are setting standards for the rest of the world. And I remember there was a big focus in California because some, some governor, um, probably not a governor, some, uh, some elected official in California suggested that they were going to, you know, take GDPR and sort of copy it verbatim. And that was a huge story in The Guardian, in Politico, everywhere. And then actually it didn't happen. <laughs> we never heard about that, you know. Um, so like there's a, there's a, there's a little bit of, I think of Europeans getting a bit carried away with our regulatory might. And actually, I think where we're really missing a trick is because where there, where there really is the capacity for regulatory might is if we do it on a transatlantic basis. 
um, when Europe, and I, I understand and I appreciate, particularly, you know, with the political flux, shall we say, that we have witnessed in the US in the, in the last uh, eight to 10 years, it hasn't always been easy. Um, but, you know, sort of powering ahead and, and, and not at least trying and endeavouring to reach common ground with the US when it comes to uh, regulatory standards is a huge error in my view. Um, because if the EU and the US have a commonality, not on everything, we're never going to be entirely aligned. Um, we're not going to achieve a harmonized transatlantic regulatory framework on most things. But if we have, you know, close to common standards on, on lots of things. AI is a great example. I mean, what is the point, in a sense, of Europe trying to regulate AI if we don't do it, at least with an attempt, an effort to, um, to reflect um, the other side of the Atlantic, uh, particularly given that the big players are US multinationals, let's be honest. So um, I think that they're, they're, and the TTC under the Biden administration, you know, again, is is the right approach in terms of aspiration. But frankly, I was on a on a webinar with another think tank, a transatlantic think tank a couple of weeks ago after the TTC with a lot of people who were really involved, including people from the US administration. It was so downbeat and mm. and 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 from from Brussels as well. And it was so downbeat because it's really not making a huge amount of progress. That is so short sighted from our from our point of view. It is so short sighted. The EU and the United States need a bit of a wake up call, because if we don't set the standards, then you know, China and and others will 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 fill the vacuum. But I'm sure people know with the trade and cooperation and council, Sorry, yeah. uh, it's is that sort of institutional framework to the US and the EU to deal with these sort of trade technology Sorry. issues. Uh, so interesting to hear that you, what you're hearing uh, is that it's 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 quite downbeat mm. in terms of functionality mm. and success of, of of the council. Uh, and then I would like to react to that because. Uh, for example, Brazil is going to adopt a, a data protection regulation, which is uh, very much like the GDPR. There is a, a lot of examples out there in the world that are uh, copying uh, the standards that we are putting on data protection. I believe this is, this is uh, I hope, maybe I don't believe, but I hope this is going to be happening as well with the AI. But we have, what we have seen around the world, China is also regulating on AI. But I mean, for the objectives of the of the of the party, uh, yeah. you know. But there is regulation out there. Uh, the U.S. just uh, published their executive order. It's not legislation as such, but it it has some kind of uh, of might on 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 companies developing AI uh, obligations or red teaming, for example, strategies on on transparency and documentation, um, which is important. There is there and it empowers the different offices like the Trade Commission of the U.S. and and others to act on competition on, on, on data privacy, for example, as well in many aspects. If you read the executive order, uh, many of the aspects that are reflected that are also you know, somehow taken uh, or very much aligned with, uh, with what we have in Europe. So I believe that is, there is, um, um, and we'll have a bit of controversy here, no, but the, uh, the, 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 I believe that <laughs> uh, we, we do have, um, we do have this, this kind of, uh, let's say, might over, over other, over others, uh, setting the standards because uh, we've been talking about regulating AI since 2019 in the European Union, and suddenly uh, we are going to Bletchley, to Bletchley Park, uh, uh, and then the, everyone is talking about governing AI, regulating AI, the UK, the US, uh, China, the same similar uh, narratives that they are putting forward. So, so it seems that, that, I don't know, we led the way somehow to, to, to a certain extent as well. That doesn't mean that there is... Um, yeah, sorry, Alexander. So just finish your point. I, Alexander, I see, see you want to come in, so and, we'll, we'll come to you next. And and just uh, another thing is that, uh, so we also have the, the strange dichotomy as well. Um, 
that either we regulate or we are competitive. And I believe we can be both because uh, what we have seen with uh, with some of the regulation is that, you know, privacy, safety, security, that's a good business. So that you can create a business out of out of those values and out of those, uh, uh, let's say, obligations that are put o o on our on our economy and our society. Data portability, right, for example, from GDPR gave rise to personal information management system, which is a business model in itself. Um, I believe the Digital Markets Act will give right to many startups entering into markets that were before controlled by gatekeepers like uh, uh, like the big tech. So I believe there is also a potential for competitiveness with uh, that coming from the from the regulation. Yeah, I think it's always important to say that that good regulation can actually be yeah. pro oh, competition be good, rather than uh, exclusively burdensome for businesses. Uh, Alexander, thank you. No, I just want to pick him, uh, pick up on the. The interesting discussion, I think, in the comparison between AI and, and GDPR and the different approaches to it. I, I'm also always a bit cautious in, in comparing, um, let's say, the potential of the EU in both domains, because it's true GDPR has had, let's say, cross-border effects beyond the, the EU. Um, uh, but I think we we have to be careful in, in, in um, approaching both um, let's say, uh, issues. Uh, regulating AI is regulating the use of a technology, whereas the GDPR is regulating, uh, let's say, basic components of any type of uh, technology. Um, and of course, the, the competition element is much stronger in, in the AI file. Now, the let's say the trickle effect of the GDPR is very interesting, but it has been quite natural, uh, which is very interesting. I don't know to which extent for the AI, it's going to be that natural. So I think it's going to need a little push. And I think there, um, the, the, the focus on governance and global governance in terms of AI is going to be quite crucial. And this is something that we want to highlight as well during uh, our, our presidency. It's where we want to pick up the ball, where um, uh, Sp Spain will, will uh, hopefully end uh, the, uh, the trilogue of the AI Act. We want to go beyond the AI Act and look at the different issues that are being discussed in terms of governance of AI, be it the OECD, the G20, the G20, uh, the G7, uh, United Nations, everybody is setting up some kind of governance mechanisms in terms of AI, and you don't have that in the GDPR. Uh, I think it's good because it means there is a, a let's say, a, a natural flow that's being created in terms of uh, regulate, oh, sorry, in terms of having a dialogue in, on on standards of AI, something that is missing in GDPR, but didn't really need, seem that necessary because there was kind of like a natural flow or overflow, let's say. In terms of um, the point that's made on implementation uh, rather than regulation, this is um, something that my Secretary of State feels quite strongly about, and it will also be, let's say, a red line through our presidency, because we do feel that Again, being in a momentum uh, towards the new European Commission and new European Parliament, um, maybe the Council could send a message that with the di digital, let's say, avalanche that we've had in the past years, we really have to get the governance and the implementation and the execution right. Uh, and this is going to be a struggle for quite a number of member states, not to mention uh, small member states. Again, maybe a role for the D9 Plus here, and not to mention for uh, states which have quite complex institutional mechanisms and systems like uh, Belgium. So I think um, this is something that we should think carefully about and where we should try and uh, create synergies be between all of the governance systems that have been pushed forward, to, be it to DSA, DMA, Data Act, DGA, whatever you have. Um, I think this is going to be a crucial debate. So a little bit more focus on the implementation, maybe a little bit less focus on the regulation, even though we all are quite conscious of the fact that um, I'm sure that the next European Commission already has or will have uh, a couple of files in their drawers that they're going to um, take out uh, quite soon. And in terms of AI specifically, I think it's going to be interesting to see whether we will now have a general regulatory framework, but will we head towards a more sectoral approach also in terms of regulation of AI? Okay, thank you. We've hit 345. Um, I'm ruthless about ending on time. We did start a little bit late, uh, so I'll entertain any final point or comment by either any of the panelists or anyone here or online. If not, 
<laughs> going, going, gone. Okay, we're going to conclude at that point. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for a lot of uh, of detail in their presentation. Um, I hope it uh, added to your uh, body of understanding of the, yeah. the, the whole uh, oh, of all of these issues. Uh, so thanks to our panel, thanks to the minister, and thanks to everyone who attended, both in person and online. Thank you. Thank you.